Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon for this session, Early Warning, Early Action, Reducing Disaster Deaths and Losses, part of Pillar 3 under Resilient Communities. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Tur Turbal, Jagara and Yugara people on the land on which this conference will be held and pay respect to their elders past and present. We also acknowledge the Turbal, Jagara and Yugara peoples continuing cultural and con contribution to the life of the Brisbane region. In the spirit of reconciliation, we extend our acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, sea, waters and community. We pay respect to all Elders, past and present. I'd like to start with a brief introduction for our session. And in this session, we'll be discussing early action and early warning systems. Disasters cause loss of life, damage infrastructure and disrupt livelihoods. However, when governments, civil societies, communities and households have access to robust and timely information, they can take action to prevent or reduce those losses. For this reason, and aligned to Target G of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction 2015 to 2030, the UN Secretary General has launched a call to ensure that early warning systems reach everyone within the next five years. And this drive is led by the World Metrological Organisation, but is supported by many of those other organisations. This session will consider the progress that has been made by key actors and working, working with disaster management agencies to monitor and to produce hazard related forecasts and impact forecasts and deliver warnings as well as how to ensure early warnings reach the people, entities and places most exposed to those hazards in a way that are reliable, actionable, accessible and inclusive of all. Really covering that last mile of the warnings value chain. We'll start um, with uh, um, questions will be asked of our presenters through the app and through the online platform. Um, we'll start with a brief video about anticipatory action. Every year, the frequency and severity of extreme weather events is increasing a lot. We're seeing more severe flooding, longer droughts, stronger storms, and non-weather related problems too. And one of the major reasons these events become disasters is because people are not prepared. Yet scientific advances have made it possible for us to better predict these events and better prepare vulnerable communities. What if you could know in advance that a typhoon might cause destruction to your home tomorrow? Or that your livestock will be in danger from a big flood that is coming in five days? Or that months from now you might not have food to eat because of drought? Well, we do know. And there is a lot that we can do to act ahead of these predictable events. We can evacuate families and livestock, distribute cash to avoid high interest loans, replenish cereal banks. We call it anticipatory action. And it's here and working right now. Anticipatory action combines prediction with pre-approved action plans and pre-arranged financing to ensure that people can act ahead of disasters and lessen the impact of hazards on their lives and livelihoods. It's a strategy that can save both lives and money. Together with local experts, governments and partners, National Red Cross and Red Crescent societies are using anticipatory action to make humanitarian assistance faster, more efficient and more dignified. Join us. Thank you. Our first speaker will be Dr. Duan Ti Tuet Na. Um, and she'll be speaking to us, if I find my notes, apology, on lessons learned from Vietnam on improving multi hazard early warning and early action. Dr. Na was appointed as the Director of Science, Technology and International Cooperation Department under the Vietnam. Vietnam Disaster Management Authority, Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in 2017. She has more than 25 years experience and a deep knowledge of disaster risk reduction and water resources management in Vietnam. Dr. Na is the architect of the Disaster Risk Reduction Partnership of Vietnam, an important national international network in the DRR sector. Dr. Na is also ASEAN Committee on Disaster Management Focal Point of Vietnam and serves as the Vice Chair of ACDM in 2022. 
Dr. Na holds a master's degree in environment from Vietnam University of Sciences and a PhD on natural resource utilisation and protection from Vietnam National University. I'll hand over now to Dr. Na for her presentation. So can you stand here? Stand up. Uh, yeah. yeah. Good afternoon. And uh, yeah, maybe I'm I'm sorry that today my throat is pain, so maybe my voice sometimes not clear enough. Yeah, I try my best to deliver my presentation. Yeah. Um, uh, in my presentation, we would like to introduce with you about the early warning, early lesson of DIM lesson learned in Vietnam. And the key content of my presentation is. The first one will be introduction. The second about natural disaster management in Vietnam. And the third one is about early warning, and early uh, action to respond to drought and the salty water intrusion. And the fourth one is lesson learned. And the final is orientation, and the way look forward. And uh, in here, um, I would like to bring you some uh, main information about our country. The location is in Southeast Asia adjacent to the China, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, our capital is Hanoi. And you can see here we have uh, more than 300,000 uh, kilometers. And uh, the population uh, over uh, 98,000 people. And uh, you can, can see here, uh, this is uh, the, the chart uh, about the damage of natural disaster in Vietnam. And uh, uh, Vietnam is uh, one of the five countries which heavily affected by climate change and uh, uh, affect uh, main, the, the main kind of natural disaster in our country is flood, droughts, salty water intrusion, high tide, etc. And um, um, uh, by our law, we uh, already uh, recorded about 20 types of natural disaster in Vietnam. And in the past 20 years, the natural disaster have uh, caught about 500 deaths and missing people. And uh, the econo economic loss about from 1% to 1.5% of GDP each year. And for the natural disaster zoning map of Vietnam, we divide it uh, into seven regions. And in each region have the own typical uh, type of natural disaster which occur in the region. You can see here, uh, maybe the, the, the word a little bit uh, small. So we divided it into the uh, seven regions. You can, can see here. And uh, you can see the, our map is uh, very long. So um, in the north, uh, they, or they, it has its own a typical uh, kind of natural disaster. And in, in the Mekong River Delta, it also has a different type of natural disaster. So annually, we are affected by uh, disaster every year. <coughs> and um, for the forecasting and warning system for disaster risk management, uh, we developed the VNDMS. And in this um, system, we uh, collect the information from the, the national authority, and we also take the reference uh, for the um, early warning information from other international organizations, uh, which we, we, we can, so that we put in our um, database. Uh, we call it the VNDMS, so maybe, uh, and you, uh, together, uh, at the national, we have a VNDMS, and at the province level, we have a province uh, uh, disaster management system. Uh, in our country, we have uh, 36 provinces, but uh, uh, it not means that all the uh, not it not means that all the 63 provinces have its own uh, data system, but now. Uh, some, some province is on the way to develop the local database because now you see for the planning and decision making, the data is uh, very important. So we try our best to, to collect and put the data in one system so we can serve for our decision making. 
And um, in this slide, you can see the role and function of the Vietnam Disaster Management System. Um, the, 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 the flow chart so the database serving disaster operation. Um, uh, at the center level, we have a VNDMS, and at the province level, we have a PDMS. It means the local data. And uh, also, at the commune, we have a base app. And in the VNDMS, we, co we, we collect, we, um, uh, collect uh, main kind of uh, information. Like you can see in the, in the slide, uh, we have uh, about more than 400 irrigation reservoirs with capacity over 1 million. And we have um, 241 hydroelectric reservoirs and seven weather uh, radar stations. And uh, with other hydro metro stations we list uh, below. And um, this slide uh, introduce about the diagram of natural disaster response in Vietnam. You can see uh, uh, in Vietnam we have the National Center for Meteorological Forecasting. And at the regional level, we have a regional meteorological station. And as a province, we also have province meteorological station. And they collect the, 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 the information like the they, they provide the monitoring data, remote sensing data, and international data. Um, as a data, uh, we serve for forecasting and warning bulletin. And at the uh, national level, we have a government and we also have the National Steering Committee for Natural Disaster Pre um, Prevention Control, it, and, and NDPC. And, uh, Ministry of um, Natural Resources and Environment is in charge of forecasting, and I come from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. The acronym here is MAS, and as a ministry, also um, uh, involved in the in the in the in the disaster on to disaster in Vietnam. And uh, similar to this, we have uh, this system at the province level. At the province level, we also have a CCNDPC. Uh, Don Re, it means the Department of Natural Resources and Environment, but at the province level. And uh, we also have a Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. And as a sector and department in the province. And at the district and commune, we also have the district uh, people committee and uh, commune people committee, which uh, serve for natural disaster. And uh, through, through this, we, based on the forecasting, we give us a warning and uh, early action to prevent and evacuate people when uh, natural disaster is forecast to happen. And uh, this is a um, storm response action. I'm, I'm sorry that in this slide, we zip, zip, zip the, uh, the app in our office. Um, so I can share with you in this chart, they say, for example, when the storm is coming, for example, what the people, local people and sector agency, what they should do uh, 24 hours before the, the typhoon come, and uh, what they should do 48 hours before the, the typhoon come and 27 hours before the, the typhoon come. So this is uh, the, 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 the orientation or guidance for the uh, people as well as the different sector, what they should do in order to prepare to cope with the storm. And in, in our country, we have also have a famous slogan, we call it a for on-spot policy uh, to respond to the storm. Uh, the first one is uh, commanding in spot. At the center, we have the Center Steering Committee for Natural Disaster. And at the local level, we have a, a provincial level. So 
uh, uh, we, we, we call it the commanding in the spot and fought in the spot. At the center level, we have uh, the military uh, uh, and the police to, to help in case of natural disaster occur, they can support the people to prepare to cope or evacuation in the case of disaster. And also similar to this, uh, we also uh, have uh, these forces at the provincial level. Uh, and nearly all the sector we involved in the direct response with not only government sector, but also other um, uh, uh, INGO or uh, local NGO or the women union and the farmer union and other etc. And uh, for the mean on spot, uh, similarly, we also uh, have uh, the uh, as I interview with you as the national uh, as the central level, we have a national committee for incident disaster response and rescue Vinasacom. They sell arrange the forces to support the locality depending on the situation and requirement. And um, from my office is uh, the National Steering Committee for Natural Disaster Prevention and Control. We sell mobile resources and supply to the uh, other area uh, when it's uh, over the capacity of coping. And another, uh, the last one is about the logistic on spot. Because when, when the disaster occur, uh, um, everything in place is very important so that we can uh, better prepare and respond uh, rather than waiting for the outside to support. So we very pay much attention on the preparation on the fourth spot at the, at the local level because uh, we are the developing country, so resources is limited. So it is very important for us to, to, to try our best to, to prepare the four, the four on spot in advance so that we can mitigate the impact of the storm. And uh, this part is uh, talk about the early warning and early action respond to the drop and salt water intrusion in the Mekong River Delta. Um, um, this is a, we call it the historical drop, which uh, occurred uh, from 2015 to 2016, <coughs> and it caused a lot of damage. You can see here in the, 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 the table, and this is the first time the growth, Vietnam is an agriculture uh, production country, so this is the first time the growth of the agriculture sector in the first six months of 2016 were only negative 0.18%. So you, you see due to the impact of the drought, it affects a lot about the agriculture production in my country. And uh, uh, I, 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 I say with you about the early warning salty water intrusion drought in 2020. Uh, with the lesson learned from the uh, we took in 2015 and 16, <coughs> uh, we already um, forecast um, in for for the drought in 2020, we already have a water instruction has been forecast since June 2019, with the impact it can and scope determine and the. A salty water intrusion occurred three months earlier than the multi year average. So, from 1 to 1.5 months earlier compared to 2015 and 2016. And uh, uh, effect, the affecting time is uh, try, is try time as long as the 2015 and 16. And the water intrusion extent in the river mouth is. Uh, about from uh, 30 to 40 uh, kilometer further to compare to the multi year average and uh, uh, from 3 to 9 kilometer to compare with 2015 and 16. And um, uh, the anti pessary action, the salty, 
sort of what in Chilson and Rod 2020. As, an, as a national government, we already conduct the meeting with the leader of the provinces and city in the Mekong River Delta uh, in September 2019 and issue the directory and legal document for drought and salt water in Chilson response and organize a conference on drought and salt water in Chilson prevention and control and meet with the local and inspecting the implementation of the ground. And together with this, we also consider to allocate funds to support for the local drought and salt uh, water in Chilson. And at the ministry uh, level, we issue the directory and legal document for the implementation of response solution by sector and field and also establish the frontline working group to support locality, uh, monitor forecasting and run effectively, and implement the solutions, structure measure and non-structure measure. Uh, also, we conduct the program for the, uh, to raise uh, awareness of people uh, about the drought for the uh, early action. And as the locality, <coughs> We, we, we consider to change and adapt the agriculture production plan and implement structure solutions to build temporary dam to prevent sockney water and storage um, water and operate the irrigation work and uh, regularly monitoring the sanity and issues information uh, and guidance to local people on proper response to the uh, salt water in Chilson and drought. And with our efforts, uh, we already, um, in this slide, uh, we compare the damage caused by drought in 2015 to 2016. Uh, I'm sorry, that's... Um, <coughs> Uh, the, 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 we, uh, we cannot translate it into English for the damage table. And you can see the total right damage here in 2015 and 16, and uh, uh, is in the zero column, and the damage from uh, for drought in 2019 to 2020 in the green. So you can see in the, 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 the damage, uh, cost for the right damage is uh, in 2020 and 19 and 20 is about 14 percent, and uh, also the uh, the damage for the fruit tree and induct induction tree uh, in the uh, in the middle table uh, is uh, about 23 percent to compare with uh, 2015 and 2016. And uh, the, the, the last one is the total household with water effect. You can see the decrease number of the household uh, affected uh, in 2019 and 2020 to compare with uh, 2000, uh, 2015 and 2016. And through our response to the, to the drought and sunny water, we take the lesson learned um, accurate forecasting and winning play uh, an important role. And the second one is the strong leadership and direction of the government, ministry, and sector. And the third one is smooth coordination and synchronous implementation of solutions among the ministry and sector and locality. And the fourth one is the effective coordination in information and communication to proactively and best evaluate the disaster situation. And the fifth one is to develop the disaster response plan that adapt to the actual situation. And the sixth one is taking full advantage of the available resources for preparation and response. And the seventh is improve the vo community awareness play an important role in disaster risk reduction. And uh, through this, we give us a way forward or the orientation in the future. Uh, we should uh, strengthen the hydro, the hydro metric equipment and network, and strengthening the forecasting and warning science and technology, and updating disaster risk zoning map, and improving forecasting and warning human resources, 
next one is uh, updating and supplementing the same mix and tsunami station and upgrading the modelizing information and communication and updates and modelizing information and communication. Uh, so this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for the attention. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Na. We'll move along. Uh, our next presentation is Action Plan on Early Warning Systems for All. And our presenter will be Dr. Johan Stander, who serves as the Director of Services Department for the World Metrological Organization. Excellent. Thank you, Craig. Um, moderator, fellow panelists, um, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody with us today. It was quite fitting when Craig opened the session indicating the call of the UN Secretary General. And far more importantly, when he underlined the point that he said the WMO to lead the initiative of e EWS, not for the WMO to own it. And therefore, we've got to make sure that everything we do going since the 23rd of March when he made the call for our action plan that's expected to be delivered at COP26 this year and going forward, we need to make sure that it's inclusive process going forward. And I think I'm going to try and summarize some of those things that we've done at this stage and where we would like to go. It will not be possible to do within six minutes, that's what we've been provided, to actually summarize the current challenges we've got. We'll talk about challenges in certain countries versus other countries, but we've seen floods in first world countries and small island states. We've seen people dying in first world countries as well as in small island states, all due to climate change at this stage. Therefore, for a inclusive, and I would like to underline the word inclusive, multi-hazard early warning system. We've got to do this together. So one of the aims that we've got to go forward is to make sure that we all work together as one team. We've got to first find out what's the maturity level of East National Meteorological and Hydrological Service, as well as, as, as well as each particular member state. Because one particular member state may be strong in one certain area, but maybe a little bit weaker in the other one, or they're strong in all aspects, but they lack communication between all of those fears. And when we had a meeting last week in Cairo, high-level meeting, um, with Selvan Hart and the Secretary General of the WMO and um, all our UN agent partners and our funders, we spoke about these four pillars of the inclusive or a fully-fledged multi-hazard early warning system. And why I say fully-fledged, it's about a full earth system approach across all time scales, meaning what the weather is going to do today for all aspects that we know, because 85% of natural disasters at the moment is weather-related. So what are we going to do about everything today and also with regards to the long term? That's why I mentioned um, we spoke about across all time scales. What's the seasonal prediction going to be for um, our crop producing centers or whatever the case may be? So we've got to look at the full value cycle or chain. <coughs> Excuse me. And if we look at the extreme right hand corner, the WMO will probably lead the observation and forecasting one. The, the UNDRR indicated that they would like to lead the disaster management one. And then we've got the IFRC, we've got FIO, UNDP, um, REAP, and all other partners that said, okay, we would like to be involved in all, and some of them will lead one of those areas. And within this week, as I'm speaking, we are sending out to them at the moment a specific um, template to complete, which will be roughly 15 pages by COP27, to really indicate what are your recommendations for your pillar and what needs to be done to complete this. Because in the middle, we've got a multi-hazard early warning center uh, system, which is people-centric, and that's important. We've got to get governments on board to make sure we make this a success. Our timeline, as we stand at the, at the moment, um, at the moment, we're in September, um, the UNGA um, also going on, and we've got a EWS session um, I think um, early next week on, on this particular program. By October, we've got our two technical commissions within the WMO. Why is that important? Because they've got to create and formulate the technical work that 
the members and member states need to implement all of these aspects of a multi-hazard early warning system. Then we've got the COP27 for our plan of action going forward with partners, and then everything that goes from then onwards. And we talk about COP27, Craig, it leaves us actually only with four and a half years left since the call of the UNSG. Not a lot of time. It's not a challenge, it's an opportunity for us to really succeed in what we need to do for, for mankind. If we then include all of this in one particular envelope and we look at the early warning for all by the end of this period, 2027, we've got to look at, like I indicated, the local level, we've got to look at the national level, we've got to look at the regional level, we've got to look at the global level so that everybody speaks the same language. We talk the same statistics when we talk about this is what's available. Because currently only less than 50% of our member states do have effective multi-hazard early warning systems. That's not unacceptable. And if we look at small island states in the Pacific, it's even worse. They don't have access to data. We've got to make sure that is fixed going into the years coming. And then running across that in a sort of a matrix way is our, our technical and scientific um, expertise, and that's our technical commissions from the WMO side who will need to develop that for us going forward. The financial arm, which I will talk about a little bit later, and then the political one. The financial arm we see as the one going like an arrow through the entire thing. It's got to go through the entire value cycle from infrastructure down to the last mile of communication to the end. And I think this almost at the end. Um, so this is what we would like to map for all of those four pillars. So each one of them will map it. Where are we now in 2022? Where do we need to be by 2023? Where are we 2025? What needs to be done by 2026 for us to be able to reach the alerts for all by 2027? So this was the basis formed for all of them. It will be provided. They will comment on it. And each of those pillars will then fill in all these blocks. And we will measure our progress according to this. We would like to have a map to say, okay, are we green? Are we orange? Are we red? We need to make sure that we reach the target by 2027. We can't wait another 100 years or even 10 years. The funding at the moment, with lovely support from the Cruise Secretariat at the moment, with funding, um, John informed me, um, he can correct me if I'm wrong, we, we just recently heard from countries like France who indicated that there's additional funding um, for um, this entire process going forward. We've got the WMO Secretariat on the Sustainable Observation Finance Facility, which is dedicated there for instrumentation for small island states and least developed countries to make sure that we also get that real-time data. Then we're working very closely with GCF and all other partners like the World Bank, the African Bank, and everybody to make sure that we get the amount of money we, we require with our partners to move forward. Craig, that's my six minutes. I thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Johan. I have no problem. Our next speaker is Ms. Sharon bagwan rolls who is the regional representative of the Shifting the, Cli Shifting the Power Coalition. And Sharon will speak to us on solutions from Pacific Island women-led innovations to multi-hazard early warning systems. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And I work with women in communities who don't necessarily have access to internet mm. and technology, so I'm not going to show you PowerPoint. But I am <laughs> going to say that the reason we do the work that we do at the Shifting the Power Coalition is because we come from communities where women have been isolated from information, even though they have the local, traditional, and indigenous knowledge to prepare communities, to build resilience, and to contribute to response and recovery efforts. So I just want to start by saying that. So one of the things for us is that multi-hazard early warning systems can't be effective if they're not involving the community. Mm. Technology also must be inclusive, appropriate, from using radio, as well as being accessible to reach persons of all diverse disabilities. There is a research report, Inclusive and Accessible Multi-Hazard Early Warning Systems, in fact, launched on March 23rd as well, um, at the same meeting where the Secretary General made the announcement about your work, um, 
produced by UNDRR in collaboration with our coalition in Action Aid Australia. So I do want to dive into those recommendations because they are connected to the work that we're doing as the coalition across six Pacific Island countries and as part of the work that we're developing our regional platform called POWER, which is Pacific-owned, women-led early warning and resilience. So it is really talking about that entire cycle, but in particular looking at ways in which we can get better at early warning, but also use the information from communities to be able to inform resilience building and recovery. And this is around working across four pillars. I come from a region where women are very underrepresented in decision making, so we have to ensure that women are part of the participation. And that means equipping women with information and technology to be part of preparedness plans, rapid response, and inclusive um, assessments. It's about ensuring protection so that risk reduction is also about reducing the risk of sexual gender-based violence and exploitation. It's about prevention, so looking at what might happen if resources don't reach communities at the right time, and how do we prevent conflicts or violence. And it's about the whole package of relief and recovery that has women's leadership at the local, um, village, district, divisional, and also national level. So a couple of recommendations um, going forward. We have to support the implementation of an end-to-end, people-centered, early warning value chain from risk assessments to infrastructure and the community last mile outreach. What does that mean? It means ensuring that early warning messages are received and acted upon by the local communities and, and supporting women to be able to access that technical information but communicate it back to communities, whether they're coastal communities, inland or mountains. It's about making sure that when they know that there's going to be a huge band of rain coming for five, six, seven days, they can effectively prevent health crises, such as typhoid and leptospirosis, as an example. Um, it's about enhancing two-way information. So it's not simply about getting the weather or multi-hazard um, assessment information only to the communities. But if we want to build resilient communities, if we want the communities to be part of the recovery and resilience and getting better at preparedness, then there has to be a two-way communication. It's really about um, integrating and investing in community and women-led initiatives. So our colleagues in Vanuatu, the Woman Wet and Weather System, is now part of the communications cluster of their National Disaster Management Office. So that is critical. We can't simply say, oh, that's a really nice um, activity run by the women. It's not a nice activity. It's life-saving, it's preparedness, it's inclusion, and it's got to be part of what becomes the um, national disaster management policy and practice. So there is going to be a need to also reform the systems to be able to ensure it is inclusive. Um, and that's where the adaptation of laws and policies actually can continue to build women's participation and build on the expertise. We need to unlock the community knowledge. I reference traditional indigenous local knowledge if you're not providing the information and the communication platforms for the communities, they're not going to get involved. And finally, resourcing. Um, nothing happens without resources. Um, to get women simple handsets that they can receive information and convey information requires sustainable resources. So through our power system across the four countries of our six um, member uh, countries of the coalition, we're going to start to demonstrate on what it means to sustain a system, to build a system that works at a country level, but also to start to develop systems that are connected to a regional weather forecasting center like we have in Nandi, and to be able to then adapt it and make sure that women, for example, in Samoa and Solomons are able to manage their own systems and work with the officials. I'll wrap it up there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sharon. Our last speaker is Mr. Mohammed Shah Jahan from the Bangladesh Red Crescent Society. And he will speak to us today on recommendations to enhance universal early action. 
Uh, thank you. This is uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, we started anticipatory action since uh, 2015, and we implemented uh, anticipatory action in collaboration with the government. Uh, support from our partner national society like uh, German Red Cross, American Red Cross, IFRC, they provided us support. Uh, so we implemented anticipatory action for flood, cyclone, and also last year we simulated uh, anticipatory action for heat oil. But here by default, my responsibility is uh, uh, presenting some recommendations uh, for enhancing universal early actions and also uh, some challenges for implementing anticipatory actions and also some enablers for implementing anticipatory actions. So from the experience of Bangladesh, uh, just I have uh, presenting here some enablers for uh, uh, enhancing universal early actions. So first one is the effective impact-based forecasting system, so which relates to the last mile already. One of our speakers mentioned about uh, uh, multi-hazard early warning systems, so, so I think it should be impact-based forecast. And another also active disaster management committees for implementing uh, uh, early action protocol and also clear understanding on the steps of its implementation process. And also capitalize the community knowledge and participation and also uh, uh, that means the community are all AOR not waiting for the disaster and also implementing anticipatory action using scientific knowledge of forecast and also in combination of community indigenous knowledge. And uh, choose the early action to reduce the most uh, risks which is uh, affected by the community. So there are some uh, challenges for implementation of early actions. The first one is lack of data uh, to understand the risks of the respective hazards and also forecast which enough lead time and good skills as well as impact-based forecast. And uh, then selecting of the intervention to reduce sufferings of the vulnerable community for a given lead time and false alarm of the extreme event of forecast. And then, if we, uh, then uh, benefits analysis of early actions. Uh, uh, people are asking us uh, what are the benefits of anticipatory actions. So, so still there are some uh, challenges to show the benefits of early actions. Then lack of understanding of early on early action systems and also lack of dedicated financing uh, resources allotted to the disaster management committee and as well as the community level. And then lack of coordination among the different stakeholders. Still people are uh, focusing on response and long-term disaster preparedness. So they should, there is a, some coordination gap between the stakeholders regarding on anticipatory action. And also lack of evidence on in, in incentives and benefits in terms of protective assets and infrastructure and livelihoods. And then lack of tradition, uh, translation of early warning messages uh, into the community language. Uh, Already uh, our speaker mentioned about early warning system. Uh, it's my understanding it should be community people centric. Then community people can understand what will be the early action, what will the uh, early action they should take uh, before the disaster landfall. And then uh, uh, there are some recommendation for uh, enhancing universal early actions. So uh, the recommendations are uh, engage community for understanding risks and need to consider anticipatory action for multi-hazard and cascading hazards uh, instead of single hazards. And then define thresholds for anticipatory action for impact, which beyond the capacity of the community to cope with. And next one, use global knowledge and development in the natural systems forecast and contextualize, and learning from the early action in uh, similar hazards used for the development, and then uh, increase the awareness and understanding on early actions among the community as well as different stakeholders, and then early warning dissemination and awareness generation and understanding on the early warning among the community people and other stakeholders. And then early warning masses need to be careful with awareness message on, on what to do, what not to do. 
and then forecasting needs to be converted into a impact-based forecasting, which will enable people to anticipate the level of impact and act accordingly. And then the messages should be simplified and tailored to make it easily understandable by the community. And the approaches and means or medium should be effectively reached out of the last mile. Lead time, sometimes they matter. So if we get more lead time, then community can act uh, more uh, effectively. And then uh, functional and institutionalization to up to local and community level. Uh, though some of the country they are mentioning that we have institutionalization system, but uh, uh, I think uh, it should be functional up to community level. Then capacity building of disaster management committee and local level, uh, other departments on anticipatory action, and also sustainable financing mechanism system to enable community and other stakeholders to take early actions and also strengthening community participation and local level approaches. I think uh, within six minutes, I completed. <laughs> now, hand over to you. Thank you very, very much, Saju. Um, we'll now take some, uh, take some questions. If you've got any questions, please put them in through the, through the app. Um, we'll start off um, with a discussion. I'll open the floor to the responses here. Um, first question. What are the key enablers to ensure people, organisations and businesses are able to take action upon receiving a warning? Um, Dr Nard, would you like to start the conversation? Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, for the uh, early warning uh, action and for in Vietnam for the forecasting, uh, uh, it, for the forecasting of the, the weather, for example, drought and uh, so the intuition is under the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. And uh, based on the uh, forecast from the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and Environment, uh, we will work with the local authority in order to identify the, <coughs> the, the, the action and uh, to uh, we include the pro propaganda to, to, to in like the uh, in uh, the lab presenter already said, how to make the common people to understand the um, the early warning message, the forecast is uh, very important. Uh, but uh, in 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 K here, you talk about the private sector involved in the early warning set, um, uh, in the early warning action uh, in in our country. <coughs> Um, the, the, the private sector, um, maybe, uh, maybe it is a custom. Uh, they mainly, when we, we uh, a little bit focus on the uh, big disaster, for example, after big disaster occur, uh, the, maybe some uh, organization, we include the private sector, we provide some support. But do not much uh, private sector we pro provide the support in advance in order to prepare for the early action. So this is um, <coughs> one of the, uh, the part of our challenge. We now uh, try our best to to how to say to to work with the enterprise and private sector, and we include the community and even the local government and pursuit with the. Um, policy maker because consider our limited uh, resources uh, we we know that we we invest one one dollar in advance we can save from five to seven dollars when disaster occur but due to the limitation of resources um, it's still very challenging for us to 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 mobilize the resources to to take the early action uh, in advance and with the participants from different uh, sectors, we include the enterprise, it is uh, challenging for us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sharon, you're on the yes. front line. What's so, your thoughts? 
I, I asked this question to a group of women in Vanuatu when they were developing the woman wet and weather model. And we were actually looking at sort of impact-based forecasting because they just had um, you know, two weeks of heavy rain. I said, well, what would you have done if you had received the information early? And a number of them talked about keeping the firewood dry. So I, I asked them, what do you mean? So the firewood is income. And so obviously you want to collect the firewood and keep it dry because it's your income, it's your economic security, but it also in situations where there are high levels and prevalence of violence, it is also a protection issue for women. So that's one. The other thing that we're seeing now is when women do have the access to information, they're obviously able to keep their families safe, their communities safe, and it's actually empowering them with that information to be part of the local disaster management system. So it is about leadership. And I think the third thing also, as I mentioned earlier, it depends on where you are. If you're coastal women, it might be about making sure that your mosquito nets are ready because it might lead to mosquitoes. If you're working with livestock, it's about moving the livestock and so looking after your community as well. So for me, I think it, it's that. It depends on the community. But so it's, a, it's important about not just one piece of information, but how that information gets conveyed to the different communities. Uh -huh. Great, yeah. I, I would like to just throw it a little bit around. And I, and, I, and I would like to challenge the people listening at the moment. And I'm going to ask them, how many of you are using the app of your authoritative voice in your country on weather, water, and climate? Because if you're not using the information, coming from the authoritative voice in that country, then you're not using the correct information. And that's, I think, one of the big challenges we've got. Go to a, a village. They may have, no, look at my app. It's raining tomorrow, no, my city is sunshine. So what's the real issue? Mm -hmm. We spoke with one of the ministers of one of the islands a little bit earlier, and the same scenario. There's a tropical cyclone approaching. What's, it, what's the path that tropical cyclone will move? Don't look at those apps. Go to your National Meteorological and Hydrological Service. They are the authoritative voice. They should provide you with the information because the impact-based forecasting training, which all our member states approved through the guidance of our Disaster Reduction and Public Weather Service branch, is there. The training is provided not only to the med services, but to disaster management agencies in consultation with communities mm -hmm. so that they understand what the message is all about. How do we measure that everyone is, everyone is covered by early warning systems for all? And what does it take to achieve it? Who wants to start with that one? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we should not uh, neglect the community indigenous knowledge. Uh, we should be bringing uh, scientific knowledge to the community indigenous knowledge for uh, disseminating early warning, early, uh, early, ac early action system. And also, multi-hazard early warning system should be impact-based forecast. And uh, already mentioned that the model is not enough. We should focus on community knowledge. We should find out some channel how we can reach the last mile people, how we can uh, disseminate these masses to the community people who didn't understand how to use the apps or how to use the Android phone. So uh, uh, we, we will be measure. We will be able to measure the community people understanding about early warning, early action systems, uh, when will be able to uh, establish system within the community level to reach the early warning, early warning system up to last mile. When we've had back-to-back -back massive cyclones, like Category 5 cyclones since TC Winston in 2016, TC Harold and then TC Yasa, we, we have the information, both qualitative and quantitative information in terms of damage, in terms of impact on communities, et cetera. So I think we've got the baseline information. The, the indicators would obviously be better preparedness. So for the disability community, for example, how early were they able to access information in the, in the best format to be able to make decisions about evacuation? Um, for marginalized communities, how early is it, is the information reaching them so that they are able to find safe and secure places to go? So I think, for me, it's more about that qualitative as well as the quantitative, because the information is there. 
We've got systems that should be delivering it. And so that's why I talked about the changes in policies and practice. Because the more we can integrate community-based um, initiatives, women-led, youth-led initiatives into those processes, the more we redesign the table of decision-making and conversation about multi-hazard early warning system, that's another indicator as well. And, but not just at the national level. It's really got to be at that local level, locally owned, and situated to where the people are. Uh, I think once you've got um, the government and the policy makers, and all of those people behind you, they then should ensure that they communicate down to district level, down to the mayors in the various districts. Because once you've got the top-down approach, this needs to be done, this needs to be communicated, then the message should get to the people on the ground. If we start bottom-up, we will get nowhere. Did you get the warning yesterday? What warning? But if, as soon as it comes from the top, and the mayor or whoever in that particular small little village understands the difficulties, of those in the rural areas. And I always want to go back to the rural areas because they are the people that suffer the most. And if they know what the difficulties are, and if it's for them important to drive there, talk on the loudspeaker, then do it. It's your job because you're elected by the people to protect them. So it needs to stop top down and then we'll know it's a success. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with him. Um, because now, uh, for the early uh, arson, uh, it is uh, uh, very uh, um, it is uh, very necessary to combine the top down and the bottom up um, linkages. For example, or now in in Kyoto, our country, uh, we are um, from the, the center level. We you know, work with some of the partner like the uh, FAO and uh, Vietnam Red Cross and as a partner <coughs> to pilot some uh, program for the early uh, action. And through it, we expect that we can develop the uh, standard operation for early uh, action. And maybe uh, we can advocate for the decision about the early action. Uh, this is our target. We hope we can do it. Yeah, thank you. And just, a, just one last comment. There's, Sharon mentioned it uh, in her last responses. What's the role of youth grassroots organisations in the early warning and early action systems? And you touched on it in your comment around ensuring that they are part of the, the decision making process there. I thought. Um, Absolutely. Um, about two years ago, we organised through our young women's program to actually get groups of young women from across our six Pacific Island countries into the weather office. Um, this was just before TC Yasa, so it was several weeks, I think, before TC Yasa. But I know for a fact that the young women found the app, they got to understand the app, they took it back to remote communities on our second main island and were able to utilize it and, dem and show what is the value of being part of networks and get getting information, but also helping their communities um, to prepare for TC Yasa and to actually be ready and make sure that, you know, the most vulnerable, the children, pregnant women were being led to the evacuation center. And so it was actually connecting them with the information, the technology, and the youth leadership as well. I'll, I'll take less than a minute. Um, we had a very, very successful regional conference of youth uh, a couple of weeks ago in the Philippines, really working with the people. And, the, and those behind them is not one or two people in the WMO who started UNIFI. It stands for United Nations International Federation for the Youth. They're working with so many volunteers out there to make this work. And I think it's, it, we should, and I, and, I, and I challenged them at the last, I said, I would like you to take this out to all the regions because it was so successful. Small children, right up to around about, um, let's call it 16-year-old, who are all part of this process. They were learning what's weather, water, and climate all about. And that is just a, a, a success story we should really build on. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, just, I think that's about all for today. I'd like...
you to join me in thanking our speakers for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.